Hello, my name is Louise Comfort. I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, USA. I'd like to thank the organizers of this international symposium on infrastructure resilience framework, especially Craig Davis and his colleagues in Japan. My talk tonight is on dynamic networks in complex time, communications infrastructure in mobilizing resilience to hazards. The challenge we face in managing risk is we're dealing with changing spatial and temporal scales of hazards. As hazards increase in frequency and intensity, risk extends in both space and time. And as we look back to last year, 2020, when the world was reeling with COVID-19, the <clears throat> natural hazards, hurricanes, wildfires, floods, and earthquakes were occurring in regional scope. As for example, in Northern California, we had the very unusual situation of dry lightning fires igniting grasslands and starting vast wildfires. And we had 11,000 lightning strikes over two days that eventually burned millions of acres in Northern California. At the same time, hurricanes were striking the Gulf Coast states of Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. And river flooding was damaging the Midwestern states of Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri. These compound events create cascading effects in damage and loss for the entire national system, the entire nation. And these cumulative losses strain the whole emergency management system. So we see that increasing risk requires a systems approach. I share with you a photograph that was taken at nine o'clock in the morning on September 6, 2020. The photo was taken at Healdsburg, California, which was close to the LNU complex fires. But I saw that same orange sky in Oakland, California, and it was caused by the smoke over millions of acres that was blocking the sunlight from the area. Now, the link between cognition and action is a critical link for risk. A systems approach to building resilience engages multiple actors who have interdisciplinary perspectives. But knowledge of past events rarely translates into action to reduce future risk. Our concern then is what conditions hinder communities from acting collectively to reduce risk that is not here yet, but that may come. Here, interacting dimensions of time, space, and scale challenge the communication of risk that leads to action. Communicating risk in extreme events is shaped by the conditions of both the degree of risk awareness in the community and the infrastructure that is available and accessible to people to use it. And the technology that shapes the extent to which communication is trans able to be transmitted, the time available for decision as the hazard is occurring and the scale of potential harm if action is not taken. So the search and exchange of information creates collective cognition of risk that structures action for people of the region. Now, cognition in extreme events represents a clear understanding of the impending threat and its likely impact. It includes empathy for others at risk, not just oneself. It also includes a quick assessment of gaps in performance and the resources that are available to meet them. And importantly, it includes the capacity to think strategically and to match resources to needs. Cognition in extreme events generates a cognitive energy to act to reduce threat. 
Now, if this cognitive energy drives action, then we can understand the tasks we need to address before the hazard occurs. We can map the relationships among the actors participating in the risk environment. We can identify the rate of change in communicating risk among groups of actors. We can estimate the potential cognitive exchange among different groups in a community at risk. And importantly, we can use multiple technologies to increase the information exchange that leads to community-wide action. Now, communities engage in social and economic activities through internet interacting networks, but these networks are dynamic and they are supported by interdependent technical systems that enable the system to function. For example, the water system depends on electrical power to pump the water through the system. The wastewater system depends on water to flush the sewage through the system. The management of all three water, electrical power and wastewater depends on communication among the human managers who are managing these separate systems. Interdependencies among systems create greater efficiency under normal operations, but greater vulnerability to disruption from hazards. So our concern is how to maintain communications in crisis. And if we go back to the early theorists of communications, Claude Shannon in 1948, Norbert Wiener in 1948, 69, his work has been translated, I think most recently in 2013, uh, there are five key components to communication as a process. First, there's a sender, usually human, uh, who and, uh, transmits a message through a transmitter usually technical, that sends a signal, usually technical, to a receiver, usually human, and it reaches its destination, almost always human. Plus noise as a distraction or interference. Any of you who've been on a Zoom conference and had the uh, Zoom uh, situation drop, uh, understand that a kind of distraction. But information activates cognitive energy that enables collective action for the entire community at risk. Now, these networks of action rely on communication, but the link between communication and action is never certain. And the uncertainty increases under the stress of a disaster. Now our challenge is to mitigate risk. So we need to ask what factors both facilitate or impede communication in disaster environments. Three factors are critical. First, there is time. The time between the hazard as it is advancing and when it will strike the community. The technology that is available for communication to all members of the community, and three, the initial awareness of risk in the community that helps people comprehend and understand the message when it comes. I'd like to share with you a communication model that we developed for a small community in Northern California, Bolinas. This is a community of 1,500 souls in spectacularly beautiful location, but perched right on the edge of the Pacific. And it has one road in and one road out, but it is also vulnerable to wildfire that sweeps across the flatlands of Sonoma County. To do the model, we identified eight types of communication that were available to the residents of Bolinas. First, there are the fire radios, which the professional fire personnel have. Second, there are hand radios, 
which citizens, residents with advanced technical skills can't have, but few people have them. Then there are the set of communications that most people have, uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, cell phones, you know, code red that the um, sheriff's office usually uses to issue evacuation orders. But access to these depend on the cell towers functioning. Then there's cognitive, which ordinary people means they look out the window, they see the fire, they recognize they need to do something. And finally, door-to-door -door communication, when someone comes to your door to warn you of the advancing fire. The challenge of our model was to identify how long it would take using these eight different modes of communication to inform all of the residents, all 1,500 residents of Bolinas of a fire risk and notice of evacuation. So we developed three scenarios. One, when all modes of communication were operating, the cell tower was up, it took about an hour and a half to inform all 1,500 people. Second um, scenario was when the cell tower was partially damaged and that more than doubled the time of, for notification of all members of the community. The third scenario was the most difficult when the cell towers were not functioning and that almost tripled the time available uh, or required to notify all members of the community. So mobilizing collective action to counter risk is a crucial step in building resilience. But we need to ask what factors affect communication in crisis. It is not just the technical system. Here we have limited human capacity to absorb new and damaging information under stress. <clears throat> we also have limited human capacity for recognizing the risk in uncertain, ambiguous context, for making sense out of that risk. And here, um, Daniel Kahneman, a uh, psychologist, tells us there are two patterns of human problem solving. One is the rapid recognition of risk, which is often wrong. And that could be someone looks out this window, he sees smoke, he thinks, oh, a wildfire. We had a wildfire 10 years ago, no big deal. I don't need to leave. But the, long, the sec second uh, category is long-term memory, and that does correct error, but it is slow, it takes time. So communication to counter risk requires, especially in, in urgent dynamic risk, requires the capacity to reach large numbers of people in a very short time, and we can only do that through a technical communications infrastructure. So the key premise is if communication is understood as a process of iterative learning, then technical means of communication can be designed to facilitate learning, to update current information and to correct error. So an information technology structure can serve as the long-term memory for the community and well-designed information technology supports collective learning and action. And finally, I share with you a design for the bow tie architecture of an iterative flow of information through a disaster management system. This is a design that we've used in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, in Padang, Indonesia, and we're using to some extent in um, California wildfire settings. Thank you very much. Okay.